So it's a very warm welcome to St. John's this morning. It's good to see those who are gathered here and a welcome too to those who will be watching on the, the recorded service online or via DVD. Uh, so for, I think those of you here probably all know who I am, but for anybody who, who doesn't, my name's Sue Champness. I'm the licensed lay minister uh, is, is my new title um, here at St. John's. So we're continuing our series looking at the first three chapters of Genesis and as we think about our world as a world created by God as a a good place for humans to flourish, we're going to listen together to a song of, of praise and thanks to God for the beauty of this world that he's made for us. And as we continue to think about the beauty of the world God's made, we're going to be moving on today to look at Genesis chapter 2 and how God made us, God made human beings, and uh, something of what that means for us. But we're going to pray together now as we uh, begin our worship, and it's the, the set prayer, the collect for this 15th Sunday after Trinity that speaks of something of our calling as God's people. So let's just take a moment of quiet and then I'll lead us in this prayer together. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And uh, in terms of things to let you know about for this morning. Hopefully most of you will have received um, Andy's latest letter by email this week. If you don't get those yet and you want to let uh, Andy know, then uh, do have a word with him afterwards. But uh, hopefully if you've received that, you'll know that uh, I know somebody was asking me as I came in about 
you know, concerns over the, the new tighter restrictions that are coming in for, for Lancashire and parts of the northwest this week, but they don't affect church services, so act worship, as long as we're following all the guidelines as we are doing, uh, we'll be able to, to continue. But it does affect meetings in, in people's homes because the, the restrictions are to do with particularly about uh, meetings. So I say hopefully you've, you've got that message because with the, with the updated addition to it that came following that later announcement. Um, another thing it mentions, just as a reminder, is that in two weeks' time is our harvest festival, our harvest uh, celebration here in church and um, it, it is possible in spite of the restrictions to, to bring along gifts as, as part of that harvest celebration because actually the food banks are uh, in a sense it's an even more urgent task than normal so we will have to be careful that we, we store the, the goods that are bought carefully and, and quarantine them for the a certain amount of time or whatever but if in two weeks time you'd like to bring non-perishable goods for the food bank that would be good and then the other way of giving that's um, again mentioned in the letter is, is online to the Bishop's Harvest Appeal um, just one other thing for, for me to mention is that um, one member of our congregation who no, is no longer able to meet with us because she's in a nursing home but it'd be good to still remember our, our Sister Zira, Zira Walton, who turns 90 on Wednesday this week. So it would be good to, to remember her in our, our prayers. And uh, Andy will be arranging for a card and, if possible, uh, maybe some, some flowers to be delivered to her just to let her know that we're remembering her. So I think Andy's now going to come up and uh, bring some feedback from our PCC meeting on Monday. Well, morning, everybody. Uh, great to see you all. Uh, yes, we had our PCC meeting on Monday, and just three things to feedback and update you on. Uh, firstly, as you know, our vision here at St. John's is to live loving, knowing, and sharing Jesus. And part of that sharing Jesus vision is our desire to reach the unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is to uh, to share the good news of Jesus with those people who have never heard it before and uh, there's very little chance of them hearing it. And part of that is our commitment uh, as a church uh, to give away at least 5% of our budget each year uh, to supporting uh, mission going on throughout this world to, to enable the good news of Jesus to be shared. Uh, and at our meeting on Monday, we, uh, we made a commitment to uh, forge some new uh, purposeful and prayerful relationships with mission partners uh, as well as financial relationships of giving money to them to support the mission that's going on. Now over the coming weeks hopefully we'll have chance to introduce a bit more fully some of these new uh, mission partners and some existing uh, mission partners and to update you on the, the sort of work that is going on but I wanted to share with you that these are the organisations that we've committed uh, for the, the next year at least uh, to supporting. So we have some, some new links with, um, with some people working amongst unreached people groups uh, with OMF and with AIM. Um, we've got a, a new link with an um, organisation called Platform 67 who are actually based locally but fund... Uh, and finance uh, some really interesting and, and great work going on throughout the world. Uh, many of you will have heard the interview a few weeks back with Fiona Stevenson from uh, MAF, and we've committed to supporting her through them. Uh, we continue to support Tear Fund. We have a great burden and desire to help our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout the world, and therefore we are supporting Open Doors, who help to support the church in places where they are being persecuted. And then finally, thinking closer to home, uh, we've committed to supporting Scripture Union, and particularly a project called the 95 Project, which is reach, trying to reach out to the 95% of youngsters who have no sort of meaningful uh, engagement with the gospel of Jesus. So I hope you're excited by that. I'm really excited about these new links uh, and being able to develop relationships with, with these new people and, uh, and pray for them. But like I said, more information will be coming in coming weeks. Second thing to let you know about, uh, which hopefully isn't completely new news, is that we've set a date for our annual parochial church meeting, uh, which is on Wednesday, the 21st of October at 7.30. 
Uh, this is the meeting where we uh, elect church wardens uh, every year and where we also uh, elect um, members of PCC, uh, those members of PCC who uh, their term has expired, they will step down and then we'll um, elect some new members to fill their places. Um, we have quite a number of vacancies on the PCC, which is really sort of the, the, the leadership of the church, the representation of, of the church in making these sorts of decisions. Uh, So, first of all, to say, uh, if you or someone you know uh, would would like to stand for PCC, then do please have a word with me uh, or or, or speak to someone else on the PCC. We'd love to hear from you uh, and to have new members. Um, If you would like to come along, then we'd be delighted for you to come along. In order to vote, you need to be on the electoral roll. So if you're not yet on the electoral roll but would like to be, do speak to me or Judith and we'll, we can arrange that. But to come along, because of the social distancing requirements, it'd be helpful to know how many people we're going to be expecting so that we can make arrangements for that. So we are going to be asking that you please sort of sign up and, and sort of let us know that you'll be coming by, by at least sort of a week before so that we can make those sorts of preparations. If you would like to come but perhaps you're not yet able to come and meet in person, then do again, please let me know, because we will uh, try our utmost to provide a a virtual way for you to join in and to be in the meeting and to vote, uh, probably via Zoom. So again, please do let me know about that. Uh, The sort of the papers and the the official notifications will will come in following weeks, but this is advance notice of that. And then the final thing that we wanted to say as a PCC is just a public thank you, really. Um, There has been a tremendous amount of work been going on in the church building and the the hall and lounge and creche, uh, both in terms of cleaning, in terms of maintenance. There's been decorating. There's been new electrics going on. There's been all sorts of things um, going on to... uh, to maintain our building, to update our building, and also to enable us to cope with the new sort of COVID reality, really. Uh, Now, out of respect for the people involved, uh, I'm not going to mention their names uh, because they don't want to to be embarrassed, but we do just want to say, they know who they are, and we just want to say, uh, as a church, a huge public thank you for all the incredible work that has been going on. It's a great testament to the generosity and the giftings of so many in our congregation that, uh, that so much of this work has been going on. So, huge thank you. Great, I'll hand back to Sue. So we're going to move on now to a time of confession. And again, one that, that focuses perhaps on our, our failures uh, in relation to our care for the world that God's created. So there's a, a response, as you'll see on the screen going through, um, that if you could join in with the, the response in, in bold type. So we confess our sin and the sin of our society in the misuse of God's creation. God our Father, we are sorry for the times when we have used your gifts carelessly and acted ungratefully. Hear our prayer and in your mercy forgive us and help us. We enjoy the fruits of the harvest, but sometimes forget that you have given them to us. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We belong to a people who are rich in so many ways, but ignore the cry of the hungry. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We are often thoughtless and do not care enough for the world you have made. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. We store up goods for ourselves alone, as if there were no God and no heaven. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to hear our Bible reading read for us by Judith, and then Andy's going to explain more about what that means to us. 
Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 2 and we are starting to read at verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gaim. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, who am I? Who are you? Uh, Where do we get our sense of self, our sense of worth, our sense of who we are that stands true uh, throughout all the different situations of our life? Uh, It's an important question. It's a question that I think is quite a complicated question today. There's a lot of confusion about it. In perhaps previous generations, it was a bit more of a simple question. We were encouraged, if we wanted to know who we were, to just look out. To just look out to society and find our place in that social structure. Whether it was our class, whether it was our, sort of, our job, whether it was our role in the family. And we were told, well, that's who you are. You're a farmer. You're a father. You're a son. You're a daughter. But of course, that way of deciding who we are, well, it's quite an enslaving way, and it's quite a fragile way 
of deciding who we are. Because, of course, it's enslaving because, well, really, it's saying, know your place. You're there, and you're not there, and you're not going to be there, so just stick there. But it's also quite fragile because, of course, if I determine who I am by being a farmer, and then I lose my farm, I lose who I am. If I determine who I am by being a father or a husband, and I lose my child or I lose my spouse, I lose who I am. So looking out to decide who we are is problematic. And so I think in recent generations, we've been encouraged, don't look out to find out who you are. Look in. Look into yourself. Only you know who you really are. What do you identify as? And this really is sort of the kind of uh, thinking that I've grown up with. You know, I grew up singing along to Oasis. I'm free to be whatever I Whatever I choose, and I'll sing the blues if I want. That's the philosophy of, of Henley and his, his you know, famous poem, Invictus. I'm the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my life. I'll decide who I am, what I do, where I go. And that's quite a popular thought today, isn't it? But of course, the problem with that way of deciding who we are is it's just as enslaving and just as fragile. Because if what I see when I look inside and decide what I am clashes with reality, then it's devastation, isn't it? If I, when I look inside me, decide I am the world's greatest singer, as you've just heard, and I go on to X Factor, and I say, I'm going to be the next biggest thing. I, I'm, I'm ace. I'm the next Madonna. And then I sing... And Simon Cowell says, you're rubbish, mate. Well, I'm going to be crushed, aren't I? Because who I decide I am clashes with reality. Or it will be enslaving, because I'll say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about music. I am the greatest singer in the world, and I'm going to show you all. And I'll live my entire life completely against the grain with reality, which I can't really sing a note. So, you see, looking out is a problem, but looking in is a problem for deciding who we are and what our identity is. And so I think the Bible, and particularly Genesis, is encouraging us to find out who we are in a different way. Don't look out, don't look in, but look up. Look up to God and find out who we are in relation to him. Remember, as we looked at Genesis 1, the last few weeks, we see that that story starts with God and it ends with God. God is the main character and we are to find ourselves in relation to him. And actually, when we do that, I think we find a sense of who we are that is robust and liberating rather than fragile and enslaving. And over the next few weeks, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to tease out different elements of this question, who am I? What does it mean to be a human in this world that God has created? Like I said, we'll we'll look at different bits of that, but just today, we're going to focus on this one part of that answer. Who am I? Well, you were created by God. You were made by God. And to answer this question, we're going to look at Genesis 2. If you've got a Bible with you, have a look there. If not, I'll I'll point us and read out the right verses. Um, But we see in Genesis 2, verse 4, we get this transition. Okay, we've we've heard the great story of creation. And then verse 4, it says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now that phrase, this is the account of, or literally these are the generations of, occurs at various points throughout Genesis. You see, a character is introduced, and then we hear, and this is the account of, or this is the generation of, dot, dot, dot. It's basically saying, look, here's this person, and this is what happened up to them. This is what became of them. And so this is saying, look, we've introduced the theme of God made this amazing world in which humans can flourish, and here's what happened to it. But we get this switch in perspective. 
You see, the start of verse 4 starts talking about the heavens and the earth. And we've had this very heavenly perspective of God's creation where he speaks and things happen. He brought this ordered, good world. But look at verse 4. It finishes, not speaking about the heavens and the earth, but speaking about the earth and the heavens. It switched round. And so having had this sort of heavenly God-eye view of things, now... Chapters 2 and 3 almost give us a bit more of a a bottom-up view of it. A bit more earthy, gritty, human-centred view of some of these same themes that we had introduced in Genesis 1. And so Genesis 2 and 3 focuses much more on humanity. It's saying, essentially, if you want to know what happened to this world that God made, well, you need to know what happened to humanity, because there's a link between the two. And so this is a great place to learn about what it means to be human and what humans are. It's a great place to learn who am I. And this is the first thing. Who am I? You were made by God. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Andy, I I probably knew that before I came to church. I'm not sure I necessarily needed to be told that. It seems pretty obvious to me. And it is perhaps obvious, but it's important. And it's actually emphasised in Genesis 2, which is why we're starting there. Our creatureliness, the fact that we've been made by God, is is really front and centre here in this description. Have a look at Genesis 2, verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man, or literally Adam, from the dust of the ground, literally Adamah. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now that verse, I think, is hammering home, you were made by God. You are part of God's creation. You are a creature. First of all, it's in our name. I said the name for humans is Adam. And the ground from which man was made is Adamah. So in our very name, God is reminding us of what we have been made from. Dirt man. That's what Adam means. Dirt man. You're made from the soil. It's getting at, you're a creature. You've been made by God. And then this description, it talks about how God formed man from the ground and he became a living being. Now that's really interesting, because if you flick down to verse 19, you'll see that's exactly the same thing that's said of all the animals. It says God formed the animals from the ground, and they became living beings, or living creatures. It's emphasising that humans are creatures just like the rest of God's creation. Now next week we're going to see that actually we're very special creatures and there's a sense in which we're different from the rest of God's creation because we're the only part of God's creation made in his image. That's very important. But don't miss the point that we're still creatures. We're still made by God. We're not the creator. We're not God. And I think that should give us a real sense of humility when we think, well, who am I? If we're creatures and made by God, we should be humble because we recognise we're part of his creation. We we see see this even in the English language. Who knows what hummus is? Anyone know what hummus is? If you're thinking of that, that's the wrong type of hummus. That's hummus spelt with two M's. I'm thinking about that type of hummus. Hummus with one M. uh, Which is uh, soil. Uh, the organic matter of soil. And interestingly, the, the Latin root of hummus is the same Latin root that we get for human. Uh, just like Adam, Adama, dirt man, there's a sense in which that's true of the word human. But there's another word with the same Latin root, and that is the word humility. And Eugene Peterson has put it very well when he said this. He said the Latin words hummus, soil, earth, and homo, human being, have a common derivation from which we also get our word humble. This is the Genesis origin of who we are, dust. Dust that the Lord God used to make us a human being. 
if we cultivate a lively sense of our origin and nurture a sense of continuity with us, who knows, we may also acquire humility. Having that right view of being a creature, of being made by God, I think causes us to be humble because it recognizes where we've come from. It cultivates humility because we recognize that if we've been made by God, it means we belong to God. That's how copyright law works, isn't it? If someone creates content, it it belongs to them. It's the same with God. God made us, so we belong to him, in a sense. And that has two just really important, as, as we close, two really important applications, I think. Here's the first thing. If we belong to God because we've been made by him, then it means that we are under his authority. It means he knows what is good for us and what is not good for us because he made us. And it means he has a right to tell us what is good for us and what is not good for us. And we, as as dirt man, as his creation, should listen to that and obey. You see that in verse 16. Have a look. God says to the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you'll certainly die. Then it goes on to say, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, it's that sense there that God knows what is good for us and what is bad for us. And he has the right to tell us, this is how you should live. And we have the responsibility to say, I'll live that way. Now, as we'll see in the coming weeks, and if you know the story, actually we find that humanity wasn't content to be humble, wasn't content to recognize that we belong to God, wasn't content to take God's definition of right and wrong. And actually we we, we denied we were a creature and just pretended we were the creator and said, actually I'm going to decide what's right and wrong. And I'm going to eat that fruit. But in doing so, we actually became less human than we were before. Because we weren't living in grain with the way that we were created. And of course, every single one of us has done that. We've all, in a sense, in the way we've thought, spoken, lived, sung along with John Bon Jovi, it's my life. But it's not, of course. First and foremost, it's God's life because we belong to God. And we're under obligation to obey him. That's the first thing. But secondly, if we recognize we belong to God, there's actually a great comfort and security in that. Because if we're made by God, it means we are loved and cared for by him. And we see that here, don't we? He makes this man and takes him from this inhospitable wilderness and plants this luscious garden in which he can flourish. And he places the humans in that. He provides everything that they need because he cares for these people he's made. And that's true, isn't it? When we we make something, when we put time and care and effort into making something, we care about what happens to it. Yeah, when my boys spend ages building a Lego model and then their little baby sister comes and smashes it up, they care about that because they put love and devotion into that. And that is the same with God. If we are made by him and we belong to him, he cares about us. Because there's not a sense that he needed us in this Genesis passage. He made us because he wants us. Just let that sink in. Someone wanted you. Someone bothered to make you. And wants you here, and that is God. That's what it means to belong to God, to be made by him. And he cares what happens to you because you are his creation. And that, of course, is why when, just like Adam and Eve, we turned away from God and decided we'd live pretending we were in charge rather than him, when we ran full long into sin and death, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live, die, and rise for us, to redeem us back, to ransom us, so that we might have life again. So in a sense, if you're sat here as a Christian today, there's two senses in which you belong to God. First, that he made you. And second, that he bought you back with the blood of Jesus. 
illustrated with a lovely little story, which I'll just end with. You may well have heard this. A little boy spent his time, his effort, his money, carefully building a, a sailboat. He lovingly put it together and couldn't wait to go and sail it on the river. And he took his sailboat down onto the river. But a gust of wind took it and the current took it down and he lost it. A few days later, he's walking past his local toy shop and he saw in the window, oh, my sailboat. And he went into the shop and he said, excuse me, Mr. Shopkeeper, that's my sailboat in the window. And the shopkeeper said, well, I'm sorry, if you want it, you're going to have to buy it. So the young boy went back and week after week, month after month, saved up his pocket money until he had enough to go into that toy shop and buy his sailboat. And as the boy put his boat under his arm and walked out of the shop, he could be heard saying, you're mine. You're twice mine. Once because I made you and twice because I bought you. And that is true of every single Christian. You are twice God's once because he made us, twice because he bought us. And you know, that sense of who we are is so secure because no one can ever take that from you. Nothing that happens in your life will ever change that. But that is also freeing and liberating because that frees you to live your life in grain of, of the life you were created to live. So that is the first part of that answer to who, are, who am I? You are made by God, which means you belong to God. And if you're a Christian, you're twice God's because he made you and he bought you. Amen. So we're going to listen to another song at this point. It's one that Andy's found that um, very much reflects a lot of the ideas he's, he's been talking to us about, and it's called Who Am I? something beautiful placed by you with care among them all every piece unique and different your love shining through you're the artist we're the image made to be like you I want to know who I am so I'll listen to you You are God and you tell me what's true I want to see who I'll be when you're working in me You made us to show your glory
I want to know who I am, so I'll listen to you. You are God, and you tell me what's true. I want to see who I'll be when you're working in me. You made us to show your glory. If we believe that that's true, we have the opportunity now to uh, respond in our statement of faith. So if you'd like to join me, would you like to stand, let's stand up together? And the, words, uh, the responses will be on the screen. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So please be seated. And Sandra and David Gaskell have uh, recorded our prayers for us this morning. After each petition, small prayers will be made for reflection. Let us continue in prayer. Let us pray. Jesus is Lord. Creation's voice proclaims it. For by his power, each tree and flower was planned and made. Jesus is Lord. The universe declares it. Sun, moon and stars in heaven cry, Jesus is Lord. Praise him with alleluias, for Jesus is Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we wake, each new day reminds us of your steadfast and unfailing love for us. We have the reassurance of your creation and your unchanging presence with us every day. As the world around us is becoming so uncertain and strange, may we continue to focus on you and on your unchanging and constant love for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our politicians who have the unenviable task of managing this crisis. Please speak to the government and draw near to them as they have to make life-changing decisions on our behalf. May we, for our part, act sensibly and may we consider others and not be selfish or thoughtless in our dealings with others. As Christians, we know that all our times are in your hands. May our words and attitude reflect that. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It is so easy at these times to become very inward looking as we have so many problems to face but it is so vital that we continue to pray, pray for and support our brothers and sisters in other countries. We think particularly of the refugees, especially the ones making the hazardous journey across the English Channel. Lord, we pray for a day when peace descends and people will not have to leave their own countries, but can live and at home in peace and safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you all who are charged with keeping us safe and well. We pray for our hospitals and all who work there. 
May they not be overwhelmed as the winter pressures come. We pray for our police, as they have to make difficult decisions if people are not behaving appropriately. We also pray for employee, employees who will have to make difficult decisions when the furlough scheme ends. We pray especially for those who will lose jobs or livelihoods and those who have already done so. Give them a sense of worth and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we now bring ourselves here at St John's before your throne of grace. We give you praise and thanks for the fellowship we have already shared since being able to meet together again. But Lord, we do recognise that this is not possible for all. We pray that all who meet with us each Sunday, whether in person or via modern technology, may have that same sense of your presence and peace. We continue to pray for Barbara as she prayerfully considers the reopening of youth groups. In our last section of silent prayer, let us bring before the Lord those known to us who are in special need of your presence in healing. Please name them in your hearts and ask for the arms of love to enfold them and uplift them and their loved ones who are caring for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Accept these prayers, O Lord, for the sake of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. In this time of uncertainty and distress, sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a closing prayer. The Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.